So welcome again, everyone, to uh, the last of our Black History Month celebration uh, panels that we've hosted here at the University of Arizona Global Campus. Um, and, and they were all uh, put together and, and, and made possible by the Global Black Community Student Group here at the university. So today we have a fabulous uh, um, a small panel. Actually, we have a tweet uh, with, with a young lady uh, Dr. McMillan, and we'll, we'll we'll talk about that a little lady. She, she's the finale for our month, but we have a student, and we have another one of uh, the young ladies that works for the university. And in the title of today's uh, session is called "Family Quilt: My Story, My Patch." Well, we want to dig into um, the story, some authentic stories of, of some of the folks that we know, uh, and and how Black history is us today. It's not a, a myth, a thing of yesterday that didn't take place. It's it's, it's what we are today. So um, they're going to give us some renditions of their story and dig in a little bit and, and give us if you if you ever watched the, the Housewives, give us the tea, if you will, uh, of some of the things that have taken place in their lineage, lineage and legacy. And we're so grateful for that. So at this moment, I am going to. Um, how we're going to handle this is we're going to play a video. They each made, uh, the two young ladies made a video. Um, so we're gonna play that one minute video so you can see that. And then we will allow each of them a chance to kind of elaborate a little on the video and some other things that took place uh, in their family lineage. And then after that, we will introduce Dr. McMillan, um, who will tell us about a fabulous journey. Um, a fabulous, fabulous journey that she's made herself as, as a trailblazer here in this York County area in Pennsylvania. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and share the screen if you will. And let's get this started. My name is Anissa. I am an Afro-Creole Southern woman. Um, our grandmother, like many grandmothers, were the center and the roots of our family. My quilt memory was our Bible. We had the big, big family Bible where you open the front of it and it lays out the generations and the family tree. That is how we kept our family tree. And I remember our grandmother, especially the older she got, it was so important for her to go down our family tree in this bible and that is how i learned our roots so every holiday when we have to gather at grandma's house we would always start by going down our roots from her mother to her mother's mother and her mother's mother mother and this was so important and we would sing gospel hymns together family was the central focus of our entire world no matter how far we left from home it was always grandma's house So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, what I am going to do is get out of the way. And Anisha, tell us a little bit about your story and some of the other things that you'd like to share. Hi, how is everyone doing? Um, well, that story was based off of my, my grandmother. Family has always been such a thing. It's a big thing for us to deeply root. My grandmother who was born in 1926, um, in the Shreveport, Louisiana, her family migrated to Mobile. Her family, though they were definitely the heritage of slaves, her great-grandmother was in love with one of her slave owners. So her grandmother was actually a product of that left land. Um, it was very important for us to tell that legacy, but because they were the Afro-Creole, they actually changed their last name. Um, their last name went from Deborah to Calhoun. And they migrated to Mobile, where they were left land. If you know anything about Mobile, um, that was actually the location where the last slave ships were founded in this country. So with the Afro-Creole roots, it was very important for us to maintain our, our heritage in, in secret. So it was maintained in the Bible, where you go down to the roots to even the slave owners and um, the slave masters. 
and even more with that history with her, she was a twin and her, her twin brother actually legally is not her twin because he wanted to go into the World War II. So back then you could change your date of birth. It's just a rich culture. And um, we were bonded together by her. She always held the fist to let us know that we had to come together and stay together. Um, I, I found myself very fortunate because being of African-American descendant in this country, you don't find too many people who can really, really understand and know their exact heritage. Even for my grandfather who was born in Selma, Alabama in 1910 on the same plantation where his grandparents were slaves. So it was very important. They understood that Black history in America is a lost history. And they understood the importance of passing down knowledge to our generations. Well, generational wealth is very important, but knowledge is how we'll maintain and how we'll stay strong and how we'll forever stay bonded and not get lost in the money and the riches. So we had to come together as a family. Um, her house has stood for about 75 years. At this point, it was the first um, African-American house in that neighborhood. It was so bad that when I was coming up and I was little and I would visit, I would notice the bushes that segregated the white neighborhood and the black neighborhood. They put those bushes there, they grew them to prevent more blacks from moving in because it was one of the well-to-do areas in Thomasville, Alabama, a very small town. So it was very important for us to understand where we came from. Um, she always used to say, it is very important to understand who you are so no one can tell you what you are. So our history is what bonded us. We came together for Christmas, for Easter, um, for religion, for as a family. I'm very thankful for that because it learned, it taught us to be humble. Um, they were one of the, the wealthiest black families in the area in that small town. But into this day, she died in 2012. Um, her legacy is a scholarship for that high school for minority children. They owned the first mom pop store in that area. And it was a small town where you couldn't, black people couldn't own weapons. So they used the backside of that area to arm black men and they would shut it down and hide it. So in this town of segregation, my aunts went to a segregated school. It was very important for us to understand who we were, to understand our, our roots as Caribbeans, to understand our roots as African-Americans, to even understand our ancestry with the slave masters so that we can have a fullness and a soundness about ourselves and, and a level of completion that could be passed down. And I have so much pride in me for just knowing who I am. So that, it always touches me what my grandmother, what my grandmother meant when she was an old hard soul. I remember she had a cane that, that she didn't use to walk on. It was to defend herself. <laughs> and you would think that she needed this cane until she picked it up like she was about to hit you. And she believed um, in herbs and she was like the doctor because in this small town, there were no black doctors allowed. So she would go and she never drove. She never drove, but we would walk in this small town. I remember visiting because my father is Haitian. So I spent a lot of time in my younger years in Haiti and I came back to America at seven and I wanted to be near my grandmother all the time. We would walk and we would walk to people's homes and she would have herbs that she's made, healing herbs and, and she would cook because she believed in healthy living. And um, she, she just was a blessing to everyone. She would go and pray for her neighbors because she knew that doctors weren't taking them in and they would increase the price to make it not affordable. You know, this is a very small town. Um, the, the school, it was still in the 80s when Thomasville High School um, became actually integrated. So in my Aunt Bessie, who was 71 years old, she was, she retired as a superintendent of schools in Wetumpka, Alabama. She graduated from that school. So this was a, this is a very small town. Even now, it's still a population of five thousand, and you have everyone who knows everybody. <laughs> and my grandmother was still revered as the missionary Willie Bell White, and wow. she she was a strong, strong woman. And I think the most that she think that the best thing she ever imparted on her family was that at the end of the day, all you have is each other your understanding of yourself and your pride and family pride will take you far and above and our house still stands now my mother actually moved into it to maintain it and that is our family home and that is our family legacy she 
um, finished actually at a doctorate in, is in ministry and a doctorate in theology. Wow. Wow, that's an amazing story. Thank you for sharing all that. I know we want to move on to bring in Yolanda, I mean, uh, excuse me, Lavanda, but I, I do have a question. Um, why in secret? You said that um, your, your heritage, you kind of had to keep it in secret. Why was that? Um, definitely because my, if you look, it's Fulton, Alabama. Legally, it's owned by Calhouns, but that was slave territory that was left to his slave mistress, which, you know, is where my family disintegrated from. So we had to, they felt that they had to keep it in secret because if that was known at that time, you would have the state of Alabama, the state of Louisiana trying to take over that land and that property. I see. I see. Wow. Wow. Really, as you brought up a couple of things. I, I, I do want to move on, but while you're there, while, while the iron's hot, I want to strike on it. So you talked about how your, your grandmother was the matriarch of your family, uh, holding yes. and networking together, but then you spoke of your grandfather as well. So at that time, um, did, did the Black woman have to step up and kind of lead the family because of the dynamics of, of, of you know, the racial dynamics and social dynamics? Is that why uh, you would say grandma holds the family together more than granddad? Um, I would say, yes, grandmother kind of held the family, the grandfather at the time, because he you know, was born in 1910. He was out there working and protecting and defending the family. He was the reason why no one kind of messed with my family. Gotcha. But my grandfather, my grandmother being the softer, definitely had to be the face of the family. So he was kind of just under the wraps because he was trying to help other black men in the community. He was secretly arming. It was illegal for black men to hold arms. You know, right. he was doing that. So it was like he was that ghost that protected everyone that knew that you better not mess with this child that he she belongs to. They called him there, Johnny right. White. She is Johnny White's daughter. That is the you know that's his wife. So back then it was just definitely a different dynamic where the man was still the head of the house, but he was so busy having to protect the black household from Love everything. It. Love it. Love it. Thank you for pulling that out. I, and one last thing. So when you talked about how the family Bible uh, was was um, approached, you know, and, and I, I, I so I have this picture in my mind of what that looked like, you know, when the story was being told. Can you kind of describe, was it story time? Did you get in a circle? Did grandma right. sit in the chair? I mean, what did that kind of look like? My grandmother has a rocking chair that she bought when my eldest cousin was born. That was her, her rocking chair to rock her grandbabies in. Pure oak wood. This chair is very heavy. <laughs> and we, when we came together, all the grandchildren would have like the pallets in the living room floor. And when we started to fight each other, that's when it was story time. That was when we had to pull out the Bible and be reminded of where we come from and who we are. That was, she didn't spank any of us. She just made us sit down and listen. <laughs> but she would pull out the Bible and she would go down the roots, starting from the very top, which was her, you know, great, great um, grandparents. Whereas the name, even my mother's name, middle name is Louise, that came from her great aunt. And my daughter's middle name is Amaria Louise. So she would pull that out and she would go down every name, telling every story, where they were born, who they were, why they're important. And then she would get down to the bottom of our names and yes. say, right now, this is the end. You are still writing our story, our family's legacy. And in wow. order for you to successfully do that, you have to come together and bond together. You cannot success be successful when you're fighting each other. Wow. And that's how she would get us to be quiet and mm -hmm. bond together. And then it came to the point as we got older, we wanted to know more about our legacy. I wanted to know about my name. My grandmother had eight children total, four died, four lived. And it was told that I looked exactly like my aunt who died. I wanted to know more about this aunt. We wanted to know more about our heritage the older we got. But when we were younger, when we just wanted to play or fight each other, she would sit us down and she would bring out the Bible and pretty much tell us that our family has been strong because we come together and you cannot be strong when you're fighting each other in your part. Love that. Love that. That is how that moment was done. That's amazing. That is amazing. Look, you made the hair stand up on a, I was going to say you, you made, almost made me do the church buck. <laughs> <laughs> when you when you say we're at the end, you, this is the end, and you're next. I think that is so powerful. And thank you right. for 
thank you for carrying that story, being able to articulate it. And, and, and it sounds to me as if your family has a bright future in you. Thank you very, very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I don't know if you can just give uh, um, uh, Anissa uh, a, 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 a virtual round of applause, if you will. We're going to go ahead and pull up the next video to hear from this young lady. So, so it's going to be a little pause there because you know it takes me a second to kind of move from one to the other. But let's see what we have here. My piece of the quilt, activism. The practice of taking direct action to achieve political and social goals. My name is LaVonda Taylor, and I'm the granddaughter of Juanita Cecilia Blackman, better known to many as Miss Cece. My grandmother was a fighter. She fought relentlessly for civil rights and equal protection under the law for ordinary citizens. In the late 1970s, New Yorkers were fighting for rent stabilization and rent control. Even today, rent stabilization policies continue to be unequal and favor privileged groups. My grandmother taught me how to use my voice and to stand up and speak out for my rights and the rights of others. It is my hope that by doing so, I can motivate a greater social change, just like Miss Cece. Lavanda for that. And I don't know, did, 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 did the video blank out on you guys? It did on my, oh, I'm sorry. I'm, what I'm going to do, I haven't put them up on YouTube yet. I'll put them up on YouTube when this is over. You'll be able to access the videos on YouTube as well as the recording. So my apologies, everyone. Lavanda Taylor, this young lady, the happiness, a marvelous young lady. So I, you know what? I'm not even going to say anything else. Uh, Lavanda, just, just go ahead and, and take the mic. Hello, everyone. Probably what you didn't see is um, there were pictures I had in my video of my grandmother um, protesting. Um, and so my name is LaVonda Taylor. Uh, I'm an employer outreach specialist here at UAGC. And my role here is to focus on employer relations and finding uh, quality employers to partner with and bring opportunities to the UAGC students and alumni populations. Um, and I also provide quality programming to our UAGC community in uh, regards to career opportunities and resources. Um, so I wanted to share the impact that my grandmother, Juanita Blackman, has had on my family um, and on others in our community. So my grandmother was born in Virginia in 1935, um, but she moved to New York City when she was uh, around nine to attend school um, because schools in Virginia during that time were segregated. and. Um, they only went up to a certain age for people of color where we where she lived in Virginia. So she would have either needed to be bused to another area that was an hour away um, to continue her education, or she would have to stay in the homes of others during the week away from her family if she wanted to continue her education. So uh, my grandmother uh, graduated from Central Commercial High School in Manhattan, New York. And after graduating, she became an activist for housing rights where she lived in Brooklyn, New York. Um, during the time she was nominated as the president for the East 21st Street Tenant Association in Brooklyn. And this is because her family and the families that were living in the building that she lived in had no hot water. And it, it was, you know, it was winter time, they had no hot water. Um, and so my grandmother and members of this association, they worked very hard protesting and persevering. Um, in order to hold the landlord accountable for them having to pay rent and they weren't receiving the services. And so that fight um, was succeeded in court and their rent money was then put in through escrow um, and it was held until the repairs were completed. And that was the beginning of, you know, my grandmother's advoc advocating. And she continued to fight for renters rights and against slum landlords in Brooklyn and against rent increases. So that's one of the things that started her activism. And during her time in New York City, um, she worked hard for change and she advocated actually with Shirley Chisholm um, with the NAACP for civil rights to make changes for African-Americans in our community. 
Um, actually, my mom told me a story about her remembering the fact that Shirley Chisholm had come to her middle school to speak at, at one point. So that was very interesting that they shared that with me. And so my grandmother's activism in New York City actually followed her when she returned back to the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia in the late 70s. Um, and in the valley where we live, it's a place where uh, my family does have a lot of deep roots. So in the past, our family has been a part of the forefront of changing the education system here that has been very unequal as far as access, especially for people of color. Um, and so my grandmother also was a very active member of our church, the Williams Chapel CME Church, and she participated in community outreach, fundraising for youth organizations. She started a food bank at our church, and that made it possible for a lot of uh, members of our community to receive food that they needed at least twice a month. She assisted in clothing drives in our community, and she was pretty much the person that anyone went to and they called on when anyone needed anything in our in our area. Um, she founded, she was a founding board member of the Warren County Habitat for Humanity. And growing up in the Valley, it really is a place with large division. There's like the very wealthy and then the very poor. And my grandmother put forth a lot of effort to teach people of color and low income families um, the importance of home ownership. And she helped them to secure housing and she secured houses for lots of people. So um, the opportunity for home ownership, it's not really afforded to many, especially to people of color. And her main goal was always to teach others the responsibility of owning their own home. And she did that through Habitat for Humanity. And many of the families were first time homeowners. Um, it was the first time their families had ever experienced that type of ownership. And she took a lot of pride in that. So she was actually honored with an award from Habitat for Humanity in 1993 when she retired from the organization um, in Warren County. And I just wanted to say that my grandmother's work through Habitat is still alive today because my mom is actually a member of the board for the Warren County um, Habitat for Humanity. So it's a continuation in my family. Um, and so my grandmother also was an advocate for Healthy Families, which is an organization in Front Royal, Virginia. And she fought against food insecurities and she showed families how to utilize food resources. Like, for an example, using a bag of potatoes to make fries and mashed potatoes and other healthy meals versus going to the store and buying a bag of frozen French fries. That's always the example that she used for us because she taught families that um, not only did they have options for healthy foods, but it would save them money if they learned how to do meal prepping and things like that. She was a strong believer in education. Um, she was an in instructional assistant at my elementary school when I was younger. And then as a proponent of early childhood education, she owned a daycare. Um, she helped low income families afford childcare so that they could go to work and was often lovingly referred to as a second mom to many children. And those children all showed up at my grandmother's funeral and they visited her in her old age and they brought their families to come see her. So very impactful um, her daycare was. And I just wanted to point out that that was the first job that I ever had. When I was 15, I worked at my grandmother's daycare and I got to see the time, energy and love that my grandmother gave to other children. And selfishly, um, I believe she only shared that with me. So it was a nice thing that I got to see that she actually loved and cared for all these other people outside of our family. Um, as a child, my grandmother taught me the importance of advocating for what was right, using my voice to create change. And she taught me about leadership. So she helped me to become um, the youth NAACP president when I was younger. and. I planned black uh, block parties and gatherings for our community. As a child, I actually found a newspaper clipping from a while back when I was in elementary school, when I was uh, being praised for throwing a community party and getting everyone together. So that was something my grandmother taught me. I would say um, that my grandmother was definitely a true huma humanitarian. She opened, she had an open door policy uh, in which everybody was welcome. She embodied kindness, compassion, um, and she just always had a love for service. 
So my family story is about a strong Black woman who created a foundation of outreach, activism, helping, giving, and honestly, getting things done. So I'm a product of my grandmother's work. I'm a first-generation college graduate. I'm a homeowner, an active member of my community, um, and I'm just the person that a lot of people come to when they when they need help. So I just wanted to end with saying that my grandmother would always say, this is her famous quote, if there's something that can be done and you can do it, be the one to do it. And because of her legacy, she is and I am Black history. Wow. 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 I was trying to type that in before you you you, you finished, but I don't type as fast as you said. If there's something that can be done and you can do it, then be, be the, the one, one to do it. Wow. Wow. I love it. I love it. Love it. So um, I, I'm not going to even, I, listen, we're not even going to mess that up and ask any follow-up questions. <laughs> but mm -hmm. um, I, the, the one question that I did have you actually answer, you're a product. And I was going to ask, how does she impact and influence you when you said it? You're a go-to person. You're a homeowner. You know some of those same things that 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 she uh, uh, advocated for. So thank you for sharing your story. We give you a a a, a, a virtual round of applause. Now I, I want to move forward. And it's in, in, and I'm going to say right away, ladies and gentlemen, we might go over a uh, time a little bit today because I want to make sure that Dr. McMillan thoroughly uh, um, uh, wrenches out and squeezes out what she has to offer uh, for us. This this young lady here. Dr. McMillan, she's a board certified family uh, practice physician. I mean, she has certifications in addictions medicine, past certifications in geriatric medicine. She's she's practiced medicine since 1984. She uh, she's a recipient of a, a National Health Service uh, Corps scholarship, and for three years has uh, served as the medical director in I guess it's Asheboro, North Carolina, um, in a community co uh, a health practice down there. She supervised physicians' assistants. She's practiced in, in York City since 1987 through 2019 at the Yorktown uh, Family uh, Medicine uh, 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 Center. And, and from what I understand, she's a trailblazer, um, if not the first, one of the first practicing African-American women uh, here in this county. Um, I, I actually met her um, given my, when I moved here, given my son they had to get physicals to play South York football. <laughs> so she kind of supervised that, that whole uh, arena there. Um, fun fact about um, Dr. McMillan in 1968, after the assassination of, of Dr. Martin Luther King, um, she was part of a student group here at the, the high school here in York, well, in York City schools, um, where they list, the wrote a list of demands uh, um, uh, to the school to, to the school board, you know, things that need to be changed and, and redeveloped. So not only has she been uh, instrumental in these communities as far as the medical uh, field is concerned, but also uh, socially, um, also as, as, a, as a pastor, an assistant pastor um, in, in some spiritual uh, uh, senses as well. I, I, were you a pastor of, um, of uh, Emmanuel? <laughs> no, I just always yeah. thought you were. <laughs> right. Well, <laughs> Was affiliated. <laughs> my well, my husband. Okay, the husband was bad. See, so that's how I put it together. So listen, I'm going to get out the way. I just want you to know a little bit about this young lady. And she's the finale for us. Uh, Dr. McMillan, uh, please uh, take the mic and, and, and um, be right at home. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Uh, I Thank you for inviting me to speak to your series on Black history and you know, considered or entitled family quilt, my history, my patch. And we know a patch is a collection of fabrics of different types, usually leftover projects or sometimes old dresses, old shirts, old ties, even plain materials that are sewn together with a hardy thread of some type. Sometimes there are multiple colors of thread. And these quilts are used for blankets to keep people warm, or they can just be uh, put on the end of a bed. Now, remember, nothing was wasted. It was always used for uh, something. And I just look back at my life when you asked me to do this to try to find at least several experiences that I could say acted as my fabric for my quilt. 
and that those pieces I'm going to talk about today, but I also decided to use some of the thread to hold those pieces together by in talking about the events from the Black history or historical civil rights area and my religious faith to include the experience that I'll call my life, my story, and my patch. One of the um, things that I'm very proud of, I was uh, the product of uh, my mother and father. They were uh, wonderful people, always supportive of me and active. And um, But I was raised in the 1950s in York, a small town. And of course, we had certain neighborhoods and areas that uh, we could go to, at certain businesses and certain restaurants that we were not supposed to go to, but that didn't affect me at that time because I had a really good um, background that included my grade school, my middle school, my high school. It also was enhanced by my church activities and social activities in the community. But my, as I grew, my experiences rounded me out uh, in grade school, certain landmark uh, black historical cases like the Brown versus Board edu of Education was passed to make it illegal to segregate schools in any school. So I benefited from that a couple years later when I entered uh, kindergarten in 1955. But in 1955, I also was uh, affected by what was called the bus boycott of Montgomery, Alabama, where uh, Rosa Parks actually sat on a bus and, and decided she was not going to move and give her seat up to anyone. And it was especially a white gentleman who came onto the bus. And this started the uh, beginnings of, of the new era for civil rights movement. Uh, also during that time when I was about uh, in uh, fifth grade, we started hearing about the Nashville lunch counter integration. And so that was uh, kind of scary for us in being in uh, fifth grade, kind of learning uh, all the things that could happen. Not only were we, uh, did we see things like housing of black individuals, the uh, dogs that would uh, try to, to bite individuals, all of those things, um, the nightsticks that were used on black individuals. But we also uh, started seeing more and more um, what we call uh, sit-ins and marches and uh, walkouts, anything that Black people could do to work against the segregation that they felt was happening in the South and even in the North. Now, when I was in eighth grade uh, in 1963, uh, I started becoming more aware of a, a gentleman called Dr. Martin Luther King, and we started following his uh, journey through the South, uh, uh, with organizing uh, marches against segregation. And uh, we were very enthused about that. By the time I got to high school in 11th and 12th, 10th, 11th and 12th grade, we started actually marching uh, and sitting in, walking out of certain areas and emphasizing that we needed freedom. We would sing the freedom songs, you know, we shall overcome. We would raise our hand in defiance with the uh, fist that meant that we were going to be free. And um, this became uh, an era in my high school days where we actually uh, identified with the segregation movement and the civil rights movement that was uh, very active in the South. And in April of 1968, I was in my 12th grade year at that time, we uh, planned a Black Pride meeting. And we decided to uh, present this Black Pride meeting to uh, the city. But while we were planning it, we had a very disturbing call. This call came from someone who said, on the radio, they said Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. And we, we sat there in disbelief. We were, we were frozen. We couldn't move. No one, we could hardly breathe. We, we couldn't believe it. And uh, this meeting was held at my house. So they had to actually um, decide what to do. And so we were trying to figure out what we would do to, sh to show respect for Dr. King. So of course we had some who said, 
well, let's throw rocks. We'll get some, uh, and we'll also pull fire alarms and we'll go out and do something. And uh, that would be uh, disruptive. And then finally, cooler heads prevailed. And we decided we were going to present a list of demands to our school because we knew that there were certain injustices in the high school. So then we also said the next day we would all leave our classes and we would actually go down to the school's auditorium to have a sit in there. All black students, we uh, actually said no white students would be allowed, but there were a couple who forced their way in, but we, we let them in. But our desire was to actually bring to forefront the injustices that we felt were in our high school and then also uh, encourage all of our students to stand up for these demands. We read the list of demands that were developed the night before. We marched over to our school's uh, administration building. We knocked on the door of the administration building. The superintendent came out and we read the list to him and we were singing our We Shall Overcome songs and uh, we're not going to let anybody turn us around. And as he came out, we weren't sure what his uh, reaction would be. And actually, he asked us to come back to a school board meeting the following week to read these list of demands. And fortunately, these demands were implemented into the school curriculum, and they're actually in effect today. So we are thankful for that. Now, but there were many riots in the city of York and across the United States during that time. And after Martin Luther King's death, we know that uh, people were hosed, they were uh, attacked, they were killed, they were hung, they were, many um, were hurt. Even in our small town, which is York, Pennsylvania, there was a very bad incident of rioting, Fight, fighting between black and white groups and uh, the, even the police. Uh, ensued. And we know at the end, there were two deaths that came out of this. One, a Black woman called Lily Bell Allen from Aiken, South Carolina, and a white officer by the name of Henry Shad. 80 people were injured and about 100 people were in jail after this. And it took about, it took many local police as well as the state police and the National Guard to quell all of this down. So around the country, all of these things were happening. And um, you say, well, why am I even talking about this? I'm supposed to be talking about uh, my uh, uh, journey through medicine. But I'll tell you, this civil rights movement opened many opportunities for African-Americans who had none. For the pursuing of equal rights for education, job opportunities, better housing, fair housing, fairness in our justice system, as well as dignity and respect. After these struggles, college doors open, job opportunities open, trade schools open, uh, and even medical schools open. And there was something that was called affirmative action that became part of this day. And a lot of white schools who did not actually have uh, students or African-American students sought qualified African-American students to integrate their schools. And so when I graduated in June of 1968, um, this was the milieu that I was experiencing because of my blackness in York City. After graduating from York High, or we call it William Penn Senior High School, I went on to York College of Pennsylvania, where I received a degree a Bachelor of Science in Medical Technology. And I was awarded after that experience uh, the Manufacturer and Traders uh, Award in Science, which I didn't expect because there weren't very many Black people in the college at that time. I was also uh, awarded the Charles Patch Aaronfield um, Award for Chemistry, which again was very surprising. And then I was listed in Who's Who among colleges and universities. So after graduating from York College, I was hired by York Hospital System to be in the laboratory, the blood bank and microbiology. 
And this is important because part of my history um, has to do with this area. Uh, when I um, graduated and I started working in York, uh, over that summer, I um, was about to have a baby. Uh, and that I was six months pregnant. I was standing in my kitchen and I audibly heard a special voice, a very small voice, tell me, I called you to, to be a doctor. And um, I was excited. And I told my husband, he said, don't tell people things like that. They're going to think something's wrong with you. So I did not say anything else. It was almost a year. I did nothing about it. And then I just said, I'll forget it. One uh, evening, about a year later, we had a young preacher come to our house because my husband's a minister and uh, we often had ministers come to our home. We had dinner and while we were waiting to get started, he said to me, you can be anything you want to be. And I asked why he said that. And he said, well, God told him to say that. And I thought, well, that's strange. And I, then I told him what I felt I heard. God say to me. And so he said, and I said, I don't know what to do about it. He said, just go ahead, do what you need to do, get started. And I thought, oh, I just, I don't know what to do. And so believe it or not, within a week, there was a young man who came into the laboratory where I was working and he informed everybody in our lab that he actually was coming to work for the summer but he would be leaving in the fall because he was accepted at medical school. So I thought, what a what amazing thing that's happened. So I just went to him after work and I told him, I told him I felt God had called me to be a doctor, but I didn't know what to do. He says, I'll bring in all the information that I used to apply to medical school. And then you can use that as well. So I, took those information. So he looked a little puzzled at me when I said God called me to do it because he didn't understand what that meant. But I took the information home. I checked it out. I called the phone numbers that I saw in there. I asked them what was needed. Um, I started uh, applying for different schools. I took MCATS, which was the medical college admission test exam. Um, I went to um, and I received applications from various schools which I filled out partially. And then I sent some in and I decided then this was too much. I had at that time, by that time, four children and my wonderful husband who stood by me through college. And I thought, I, I just got a job. I have to make some money. I cannot keep um, uh, causing or allowing him to have to keep working and I'm doing other things. I wanted to help support my family. And I said, I'll wait till my children are grown. Well, within a month, I received a call from the medical school who said they're waiting for three letters of recommendations and a hundred dollars. And I thought, oh, well, that doesn't make sense. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll just wait. I hung it up and I thought, I'm not doing anything like that. I'm just going to let that go. I then, uh, Kept working I was because I loved my new job. But then I got a call two weeks later and he said, we're calling to find out the status of your letters of recommendations and the hundred dollars fee. And I thought, all they want is money. I can't believe this. So I thought, no. And so I told him my sad story. I just graduated from college. I had no money and I had four children. There's no way that I could would be accepted. And he said, don't worry about that. He said, just send your letters of recommendations and the hundred dollars. And I thought, okay, I'll do it just to get him uh, to stop bugging me. So I sent it in and I thought I would probably never hear it again because they just wanted money. And the next thing I know, two weeks later, I received a letter for an interview for that college and medical college. And my husband and I, we were ecstatic. My husband took off work. I took off my job. We asked my aunt to babysit for us. And we went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And when we got there, they 
uh, told us that we had three interviews to complete. So the first interview went wonderful. We had a great time. The person that talked to me, no problems. Second interview, uh, excellent. I just enjoyed it. And then he asked me at the end, why do you want to be a doctor? And I said, I love to help people. I love science, et cetera. And he looked at me again and said, why do you want to be a doctor? And there was that little voice inside that I heard over again. And it said, tell him that I called you to be a doctor. And I thought, no, 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 no. I, inside of me, there was this big struggle. No, I'm not saying anything like that because they're going to think something's wrong with me. And finally, I closed my eyes and gently said, God called me to be a doctor. And the interview just looked at me and he finally walked out of the room and he went out and he came back in and he said, your third interview will be done by a different doctor because the doctor we previously engaged can't come. So we've asked another doctor to uh, evaluate you. So I thought, oh my goodness, what's going to happen? I was afraid. I was shaking inside. They said, why don't you have lunch? And this, the next doctor will come after lunch. I couldn't breathe. I couldn't swallow. So I definitely could not eat lunch. And I waited. We waited in the room. And finally, this uh, tall doctor with white hair and uh, immaculately dressed, austere looking, appeared in the room with half rim glasses coming down his nose. And he looked at me and said, I'm from the Department of Psychiatry. I came to interview you. Now, I was scared to death because I had assumed they thought something was wrong with me. And I sat there just shaking inside. But the interview was wonderful. He, he was so gentle, so nice. And I thought, this doctor, uh, this is going to be, be fine. There's not a problem. So he asked me about my college courses, how I did with them. And then he asked me the dreaded question, why do you want to be a doctor? And I thought, I can't say it. I said, no. I, I, and inside of me, that little voice said, do that. Tell him I called you. And I thought, no, I can't do it. And then I just closed my eyes and I blurted it out. God called me to be a doctor. And he just sat back and folded his arms. He put his glasses down even a little further on his nose. And he then, after a minute, he sat forward and he looked at me and he said, you know, I was in my third year of seminary when God called me to be a doctor. And I thought, what an incredible coincidence. And we just laughed. We had such a wonderful time during that interview. And I went home. We were fine with it. And I thought, everything's okay. Five days later, I got a letter from the college and they actually, um, it was a letter of regret stating that we're sorry. We have no room for you. You, you applied too late. Uh, we want you to apply next year earlier and we will uh, get back in touch with you. And I thought, wow, this is crazy. All they wanted was a hundred dollars. I knew this was a problem. And I thought, oh, I, I was so disappointed. But then I thought, this is my fault. I waited. Why didn't I do it ahead of time? So that evening we had a church service to attend. And so I went to the church service and I just said, uh, I was, I prayed and I said, I'm sorry that I didn't do what I needed to do at the time. And I asked, and I said, well, I have a job. I'm thankful for the job, my children, my husband, and I'm just going to go to church. And at that service, it was such a beautiful service. And we, and the people just praised and magnified God. And, and that small voice said, if you praise and magnify me, I'll open the door for you. And I thought, well, you know, that's okay. I'm fine with it. I'll just wait till next year. I'll wait till my children are grown and then I'll reapply. But after that wonderful service, I went home. I, my mind was finally cleared. I was happy with what I was doing. Three days later, I received a certified letter 
And that letter, I opened, I, before I opened it, I thought, oh, they're sending back my $100. That was good. They should never have asked me for it. But instead, I opened the letter and it said, congratulations, you have been accepted into the 1980 freshman class of Hahnemann Medical College, and you're to report. And they gave me the date and the time and all of the th information that I needed to be uh, uh, used at the medical school. And so we were just overjoyed. We didn't know what to say. We jumped, we <laughs> cried, we did all kinds of things. But then we decided, you know, we had to sell our home. We had to get our children uh, scheduled for school. My husband had to find another job. And we finally got to Philadelphia to be in medicine. And that medicine experience for me was wonderful. I loved every part of medicine, surgery. I love obstetrics. I love all of that, Radi radiology, gynecology, everything, every medicine, pediatrics, and every part of that. I actually uh, could not decide what track of medicine I wanted. So I chose family me medicine so that I could participate in all of these areas. And I did. Uh, I did family practice and uh, family medicine track, and I did well. I was uh, one incident in medical school that I remember. I couldn't remember a lot of uh, what we call incidences of um, like racial in, in, uh, problems. But one of the physicians asked me why I was at med in medical school and how many children I had. And I had no idea why he wanted to know that. But I just told him I had five children by that time and that and I didn't tell him why I was in medical school. I just smiled. And he said, well, you need to go home and take care of your children. So that was the only incident that I remember where I felt that there was something negative said to me. But I, that incident also increased my determination to do well and to do my best. And I prayed that God would help me do my best. And I became a tutor counselor for other African-American students who were, and Hispanic students who were admitted to medical school at that time. And at my graduation, I received the Milton Betty Crown Gold Award for Outstanding Performance in Family Medicine, as well as a certificate of distinction for consistent excellency in academic performance in the field of internal medicine and the National Health Service Corps scholarship for three years. So the Lord blessed me to do all of those things, five children, my family in uh, that situation. And we were so thankful, completed my uh, graduation from medical school. I completed my residency from Lancaster General Hospital. I went to Asheboro, North Carolina, and you read uh, the things that um, I accomplished there, the medical director of the community health practice, as well as a child medical examiner and a medical supervisor of the physician's assistants and their uh, screening clinic. And I also um, had uh, one incident happen in North Carolina that I was really uh, kind of uh, concerned about. Uh, for one thing, when I first got down there, this is the first time I had ever been in the South. I actually had gone no further than Washington, D.C. But in the South, uh, I, I was a little concerned about the possibility of racism. And, but when I got there, I got a call from the a representative of their medical society. And so he informed me that none of the doctors would be able to uh, exchange call with me. So here I am in this town, single physician, no chance of any relief for a doctor relieving me with call if I need it for any reason. So I thought, well, I was just so overjoyed, it didn't matter. So I thought, that's okay, I'll do whatever I need to do. I was the first assistant for any surgery that my patients needed. I did medicine as well as pediatrics and I delivered babies all in that um, practice. But also the first night that we got to Asheboro, we were watching television and on television, uh, there was the doctor that we saw at the clinic and he actually uh, was standing there in front of the judge uh, with handcuffs on. And I thought, 
well, are we in the right place? Maybe I made a mistake coming down here. But, and the practice uh, was very small and I thought maybe I shouldn't have come. But as we practiced, uh, it grew, it grew to the point we were actually practicing in a home that was converted into an office. Um, not very uh, helpful, but it worked. But we were able to increase the amount of patients coming into the practice to the point where we were offered an office on what was called Doctor's Row. And Doctor's Row uh, was across the street from the hospital where all the doctors had an office. And so it was really interesting. And uh, one day I was coming out of that office and the doctor that had called me and said they cannot um, help me with call actually was surprised because his office was like three doors down. So he was really surprised that I was coming out of that office. But that's how God uh, planned that for us. So we were uh, just uh, blessed by the end of my time in uh, Ashboro. I was um, there was a call from a newspaper reporter in York, Pennsylvania. It was either the Gazette or the Dep Dispatch. I wasn't sure which one of them, the papers uh, called, but they called to actually um, do an article in, about why Black professionals were not returning to York. And uh, so I was one of the interviewees that they had. And I said, well, for one thing, there was a lack of opportunities. There were very bad lending practices with banks. Uh, my, there was a lot of racial tension and, and I remember the racial riots in New York. And um, I thought, you know, I'd have to come back and practice around people I knew, around friends, around family. And I thought, I am never coming back to New York. And I told him that I'm never coming back. So I got a call from two doctors in York, Dr. James Mulligan and Dr. Kenneth Worthwine, who actually decided to um, give me an uh, opening. And they asked me if I would uh, come to their practice, it was an inner city practice, see if there was anything uh, that I could would be uh, willing to do in, in terms of joining their practice. And I told them, no, I was not coming back to York. And then I received in a couple of weeks a letter from them discussing their need and asking if I could come and see their practice. They would take care of the cost of it. And they would also, also offer me a place in their practice. And I thought, no, I don't want to go. And But our parents were in York and our family was in York. Our church was in York. So we prayed about it, my husband and I. And that small little voice said, go back home. So that's what I did. Um, we, I went back to York. I joined the family practice of Yorktown Family Medicine Associates, and I became a uh, doctor on the medical staff at York Hospital. Practiced 32 years in York, and um, after 32 years, I've retired now, and I'm on to working on a housing for homeless male and female veterans. And we're uh, doing that. And I've been a member of multiple uh, organizations in your community, as well as community projects. I also became a member of the board of trustees of your college and the chairperson of the education committee for eight years. And so this is my quilt. And I'm ending it with this knot. Looking back, I, it's been he. It's there's been an incredible God, an incredible family, and an incredible life. Thank you. Wow, wow! Thank you for that. Thank you for that. I was I was a. Uh, I was there with you. I could see the images like I was watching the movie <laughs> as it was taking place. I don't know if anyone in the audience, I forgot to put in, in the chat as you were talking because I was just kind of really listening to the story. If anyone has any particular questions for you, um, if you can thrill them in the chat, I will make sure that um, uh, Dr. McMillan answers them. But I, I do want to know, um, so you, you, you mentioned how uh, you got several awards, especially in your time at your college when you were working on your degree. You had several awards that happened. Um, and um, 
I'm trying to tie two things together and hopefully it makes sense. So we did some research and we found that uh, that the app potential populations usually um, see um, what others would call burdens or obstacles um, as motivators. So uh, my question to you, um, obviously I know you're a high achiever. I mean, I just know you are, <laughs> right? Um, do you think that um, a lot of those awards that you received early on were a result of maybe some obstacle of mistreatment or being held to a different standard? Or was that just your, your culture for yourself? I'm going to be the best. For me, it was the culture of being the best, understanding that um, actually I had not expected those kind of things. I, I was just expecting to do well in school, do my best. And, um, and I believe with doing what I could do and with what God had intended for me to do, I think they came together, uh, making it even more of a, a symbol of that, the call that I had on my life. Mm -hmm. And so when I worked as hard as I could, the Lord gave me the extra to go above and beyond what I could. I thought I could do because I had no idea that I was working at a level to even receive those kind of uh, awards to, because there weren't very many black people in your college at that time when I went or in medical school when I went. So it was really uh, those are achievements that I, I, I personally, I did try. I had excellent help from my husband who did so much to make sure that he supported me and my family. So it was the effort. Yeah. I think that was another question I wanted to see if you would elaborate a little on if you were comfortable. I don't know. But at one point you moved. Uh, so when you were accepted to medical school and you moved from New York to Philadelphia, your whole family went. So you had several yeah. children, husband. So that's 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 quite an uprooting. Um, mm -hmm. So I'm sure there were some challenges involved with that. But yet you said you didn't face much, uh, um, uh, I'm going to say racial tension other than overtly. It sounds like there was some, some in <laughs> There was some invert uh, uh, racism going on. Is that something that you would be willing to elaborate a little bit on some of the challenges that, that you may have had to adjust to at that time? Oh, sure. Um, with moving to Philadelphia, again, uh, we were actually not too uh, trusting of going to Philadelphia. It was a big city coming from York, which is small, and not knowing the city. But, and then with four children, uh, we had no... Uh, real housing that we knew of. We had very little money to even afford housing. So that was a challenge. Finding schools was a challenge. Finding babysitters was a challenge. Uh, and also finding a job for my husband. And he was, uh, he was said it, that he would have a job in Philadelphia. He would be transferred by his company, but uh, it actually didn't happen. Wow. as they had uh, said they would. And he, but he did find a job. The Lord provided for us. And after the first year, um, I received the National Health Service Corps, which not only gave me uh, finances for my medical education, but it also gave me a stipend to help with living expenses to some extent. But, uh, you know, we were so happy about what was going on. We didn't realize we were very poor other than, and we didn't know, you know, we didn't have as much food as we'd like. We didn't know we didn't have the clothing. We were just so happy to be in the place that we were. Love so it. the hardships didn't seem as, as much. <laughs> love it. Love it. I, and, and thank you for pointing out. That's kind of why I wanted to ask, because uh, many people will, will listen to this recording and I wanted them to hear some of the struggle, but the mindset and, and the charge behind the struggle was, it sounds like your, your focus was on the vision. Your focus was on, on, on the promise, if you will, what, what you were going to. So what, what you were uh, uh, experiencing at the moment was minimized because of, of, of the prize at the end. So thank you for that. So uh, one last question for you, um, because I know um, you are a trailblazer here in York in the York area as far as licensed and practicing uh, uh, African-American woman. Um, 
did you meet any opposition or or I'm going to use a, a term from the housewives, any side eye, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, experiences at all? <clears throat> I, you know what? Um, I'm sure I did. Uh, when I came to uh, York, Dr. Worthwine and Dr. Mulligan, uh, they, for one thing, uh, offered me a place in their practice, which was very unusual because Blacks did not have a place. I had a Black um, obstetrician gynecologist who I, I graduated from medical school and he had gone through his residency training. He was planning on coming to York and he said the bank would not lend him money to start a practice. And so I thought, that sounds like York. <laughs> and, but he he went somewhere else. But that was one issue that I knew would be an issue for me, uh, learn, having the av availability. But I remember in the office practice, sometimes patients were a little leery of a Black physician. They weren't used to that. And I had remember one woman who came out of uh, the office after she saw me in the office and I gave her uh, medications that were in, normally in the office. And she came out to the front desk and she slammed the medicine on the front desk and said, I'm not taking these. I've never seen these kind of medicines before and I'm not taking them. <laughs> so, but surprisingly, Dr. Mulligan got up, he went over to the desk and he picked up the medicine and he said to the woman, if you don't take this medicine, you cannot come back to this practice. Wow. And that was the end of that. I was wow. given full. And then I knew I had full access and privilege to that practice. Wow. And that and since then, it, I've, I've not noticed that. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I've not noticed. That. I love it. I love it. I, I have not noticed it. So again, your eye was on the prize. Your eye was, on, was focused on the vision. Listen, Dr. McMillan, it has been a privilege for me. I mean, I've, I've you know, I've, I've been in circles around you, you know, you, you know my wife more than you know me because she's, yeah. she's your, right? But uh, I've never actually heard your story directly. I've heard some from your daughter, Ayana, but um, just, just, uh, um, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. So we've gone over and, and some of you have stayed on. I want to thank those of you that have stayed on over the time. We know that your time is precious. We do not take it lightly. Anytime you, because time is one of your most valuable assets. Once you spend it, you can't get it back. You can't repurpose it. We know all those things. So we appreciate you. The recording will be up and running uh, within a day or two. This concludes our Black History Month celebration for the year of 2023 and it has been an amazing journey thank you to the global black community student group who has uh, uh been the brainchild for this and entrusted me to host as much as we've been able to host listen i cannot wait for 2024 to see what we come up with dr mcmillan i applaud you i thank you and and i i can't even uh, I just think you have today uh, given some people some permission to exhale and to reach for their next, to reach for their next. So thank you for sharing your story. Um, if all is said and done, we're going to conclude our celebration this year. And we thank you very much for being a part of it. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.